Alors, les jeux vidéo en elle. Ouais. <laughs> Was this supposed to be in English? <laughs> So we're talking about game dev at Elm today, and we're going to be taking a very quick whirlwind tour of entry-level uh, game development in Elm. So quickly, quick show of hands, uh, who in the room here uh, has sort of fantasized or dreamed about making a video game at some point? Yeah, a lot of people. Uh, who has started a game? Yeah, a lot of people. Uh, who has actually completed a game? Okay, we're a pretty good group here. So, like many of you, uh, I've always kind of fantasized about building a video game at some point. Uh, I'd started a lot of side projects and just never got anywhere, never completed anything. Uh, but last year, something changed. I built three actual games and participated in a fourth. Very quickly, uh, the first one here, Safe Key, was a uh, pirate-themed tower defense game. Uh, down the River was a um, obstacle course side scroller uh, based on the Roman founding myth of Romulus and Remus. Ship It uh, was an unfolding or idle game that I built with several colleagues. Uh, it has themed around uh, package delivery where you start by hand and you level all the way up to time travel. And then finally, uh, Muses is a turn-based digital card game uh, inspired by the Greek goddesses of creative inspiration. So what changed last year? Well, in 2018, I joined a game jam. And you might be wondering, what is a game jam? Uh, put simply, it's an event where people get together to build games. These might be in person or they might be virtual. Uh, they often have a theme that goes with them. Uh, and they might be over a very short period of time, uh, an afternoon, a day, a weekend, uh, but some of them are stretched longer, so over a month or two. So why Game Jam? Why is that important? Uh, one of the biggest advantages of Game Jams is at the end. Uh, a hard end date has many benefits, including focus. Not in the, like, ah, sort of sense, uh, personally, I'm not one of those people that works best under pressure. I tend to freeze. Uh, but it's great to have a limit on your ambition. Uh, I found that open-ended projects tend to fizzle out. There's just always new things to try, new things to learn, and you never ship anything. So a deadline helps you to focus, and it forces you to make the hard decisions. A deadline also brings closure. So when the game jam is done, you publish something, maybe it's not as polished as you'd like, that's okay. You put it out in the world and you move on with your life. Jams also provide a community. This might be in person or online. Uh, the people you build a game with, or maybe just it's exciting to see what other people are doing on the same theme. So where do I start? Uh, if you've never built a game before, this is a, a question that's full of possibilities. But the answer is not to start with tech. Socrates famously said that the unexamined life is not worth living. And so the question you want to ask yourself is, what do you want out of the experience of building a game? How you answer this question will impact what you build and how you build it. Let me walk you through my motivations uh, for joining a game jam. The first thing is I wanted to ship a completed artifact, something playable by the end of the deadline, no matter how minimal it was. I also wanted to learn some fundamentals, so I didn't want to learn a game engine or anything. It was just, let me use Elm and see what I can do. I wanted to experiment with different techniques. Uh, for example, I first tried out Elm UI on the card game, Muses. Although, try not to learn all the things on one project because you will never finish. Finally, I wanted to maintain some kind of life balance. Uh, I wanted to be able to still engage in normal social life, not burn out. Uh, and this tends to favor longer game jams. Uh, the ones I participated in generally were about a month. So how do you find a game jam that meets all of your criteria? Uh, I find itch.io is a great place to look. There's constantly jams going on there, and you can sort of see a calendar of what events are coming up. Uh, personally, uh, I can recommend uh, Mythologem, 
Uh, this is an event that happens once or twice a year. Uh, they're longer jams, they last one or two months, and they're generally themed around a particular mythology. Uh, the last one this past spring was just general world mythology. You can pick anything you want. Uh, past events that I've participated in have been uh, Greek and Roman mythology, respectively. So once you've picked a jam, it's time to get started for real. Uh, decide on a game that fits the requirements of your jam and your own personal constraints. You're going to want a very ruthlessly small scope. Remember, remember you have a hard deadline. Are we good? We've got a small scope. Now cut some more. On safety, the pirate tower defense game, I thought that I could build an engine of sorts and then just design levels for it. Uh, in the end, I was barely able to ship a single level. So make sure to limit your ambition. You can always extend it later. It's important to ask yourself, what is the core mechanic of your game? In retrospect, here's what I came up with for safety. I decided that safety is the puzzle game where the user attempts to find the optimal placement for towers to prevent pirates from arriving at their goal. So given this, the path to success is I need to be able to place towers. I need to have pirates move towards the goal. I need to be able to shoot at the pirates and then just win or lose conditions based on whether or not I hit the pirates. The earlier we can arrive to this minimal uh, path to success, the more time we have for polish, experiments, and learning. Here's some obvious things we might cut that you would expect in a normal tower defense game. We don't need multiple tower types. We don't need many levels. We don't need tower upgrades or multiple waves of pirates. And here's some less obvious things that we can cut. Uh, we don't need pirate AI. Now, it would be fun to have a pirate AI that navigates through the map, but as a first pass, we can maybe get away with a hard-coded route. We don't need collision detection for our cannonballs. We could try to just do a simple distance check uh, from the tower. And then finally, we might be able to get away uh, with a single, pi a single pirate and a single tower in the game. Uh, it's not much, but it does fulfill uh, that core mechanic that we're trying to uh, give to the user. Remember, we have a deadline, so it's okay to hard code and brute force where we need to. We want to make sure that we're spending the most of our time accomplishing our goals and not uh, doing busy work. We want to get to a point where our game is technically playable as soon as possible. And this might be as simple as just an intro screen and a win screen, and then gradually introduce more features. I'm a big fan of the iterative approach. And speaking of iteration, uh, game loop is a term that you'll often hear uh, in the dev community. Um, and it's a mental model uh, to, as a way to think about how games work. We think of games as like one sort of big continuous thing, but they're often broken down to very small sort of cyclical parts. For example, the classic American board game Monopoly uh, has these cycles where a player will roll some dice, move a game piece, execute some actions, and then turn passes on to the next player and they go through the same loop again. In Elm, we could model it like this. So we've got these messages, and particularly the one that's interesting is the user ended turn, because that kicks off the next iteration of our loop. In turn-based games, your game loop is going to be driven by the user. So typically by pressing a button or some other kind of interaction. This is the uh, message type for Muses, the uh, digital card game, and so this is turn-based, and you'll notice there at the very end there is the in turn message to take to the next loop. Real-time games are slightly different. Uh, instead of being driven by the user, uh, your game loop is going to be driven by the clock. And you can usually do this with a time subscription. So you set up some kind of subscription, and then you just have a tick message. Uh, here's safety, the tower defense game. Uh, you can notice at the top there's a tick message. Similarly, down the river, the obstacle course, uh, also there's a tick message up there at the top. So now that we've got our game loop down, let's get into graphics. This is the fun part. But it's also an easy way to waste time. Uh, ask yourself again, does this align with your goals? 
If you want to get better at art, then great, spend a lot of your time here. But you have to be okay with shipping a game that's mostly static, but maybe looks amazing. If you don't want to spend too much time on art, uh, placeholders are a great way to unblock yourself without thinking too much time into art up front. Here's down the river for much of its development. You can see it's just blocks of color. Uh, and here it is replacing some slightly better art. So obviously I'm not an illustrator. Uh, and maybe you're thinking that for yourselves as well. So here's some other things that you can do. Uh, doing digital art might be more difficult, so maybe try something hand-drawn. Uh, if you don't want to draw the art yourself, uh, you can check on the internet. Uh, there's lots of great places you can get art. Uh, I'm a big fan of Kenny.no. Uh, there's tons of free game assets there. Uh, for example, all of the art for safety came from Kenny's uh, pirate pack. And you'll notice up in the top right corner here uh, is all the terrain tiles. Um, this is what's known as a tile set, and here's kind of what it looks like up close. That's all the different pieces for uh, building a map. We can import it into uh, an editor. This is Tiled, and Roman showed this off uh, yesterday. Uh, and you can use Tiled to build levels, build maps. Uh, this is super fun. So once we've taken the time to build a map, and maybe even wasted most of our time building levels, uh, let's actually write some code. We're going to have to choose a technology for rendering. The most straightforward way is to use HTML. If you've written Elm before, you know how to do this. Uh, the Ship It game was built this way, uh, but there are also some fancier libraries you can use, such as Elm UI, which is what I use for Muses. Uh, some other options are SVG, which, similar to HTML, has a core package library that we can use, uh, and WebGL. This one's a little bit fancier. It's going to require a deeper dive uh, into learning new concepts. Uh, personally, I haven't tried it, but a lot of people who are talking about games today uh, have mentioned it. Finally, uh, there's Canvas. Uh, this used to be the default front end for Elm uh, way back in the day before uh, Elm supported HTML. Um, and I've used it for several of the older games that I have that were written for Elm 018. Nowadays, though, it's not really available. There's some things you can kind of do to get it, but it's probably not a realistic option for a Game Jam project. However you end up rendering, though, you're going to end up with a view function that looks like this. It takes in a model, and you render out some HTML. So given a model that looks like this, uh, we have a pirate at position 1050. Do we just render the pirate and then 1050 in the view? That's pretty easy, right? Um, it's actually trickier than that. Uh, let's take a few minutes to talk about some math, specifically coordinate systems. This here is the classical Cartesian coordinate system. Uh, we have zero, zero in the center, uh, but you might be working with just one of the quadrants, most likely quadrant one up here, with your zero, zero point in the bottom left. This is the browser's coordinate system. It has zero, zero in the top left. It kind of looks like quadrant four. If we look here the, in the bottom, but it's different because the y-axis is inverted. Notice that y gets bigger as you go down. Okay, so do we just render it 10, negative 50 then? Or maybe store the inverted number on the model? Well, things are about to get worse. If you have panning in your app, it might look something like this. So the clear area is the part of the map that the user can see. And when they move that around, when they pan, your zero, zero point on the corner of the screen also moves. Notice that while the screen zero, zero moves around as you pan, the world zero, zero at the bottom corner of the world, that's absolute. Also zooming. So again, here we have uh, the clear area is what's shown to the user. And the height of the ship is about 200 pixels. But if we start zooming in, now we're viewing a smaller part of the world in the same amount of space on the screen. So everything is bigger. Now the ship is 500 pixels. Now the ship didn't actually grow in the in-game world. We're just looking at it from closer up. It's important to remember that view positions and sizes are relative. 
as opposed to game world positions that are absolute. So how do we bring some order to this mess? Well, the compiler can help us, but we need to communicate. And in Elm, we do this via types. We can create here some simple type wrappers for feet, pixels, and then pixels per foot. Uh, you can think of pixels per foot as effectively your zoom level. We might also want some type safety around our different coordinates. Uh, points that are relative to the world are not necessarily the same as points relative to the screen, and we don't want to be able to do math on two different points of different types, uh, except in very specific and constricted uh, scenarios. So this is not a talk on units of measure. If you're interested in the idea of communicating uh, with a compiler about the different meanings of numbers in your programs, I gave a talk about that at Elm in the Spring. You can look it up on YouTube. So putting together all the numbers and things that we saw, uh, we come up with the concept of a viewport. This is a mental model for what the user can see and the part of the world that they can interact with. So we're modeling that clear window that I've been showing you in all these images. In code, it might look like this. So we have a position that's relative to the world, a width and height in pixels, and then a zoom level. The final piece of the puzzle is a function that looks like this. Given a viewport and a point in world coordinates, we can now convert it into whatever screen coordinate we have. This function takes care of all the axis uh, changes, translating, scaling, all that good stuff. And then we store our viewport on the model. The key lesson here is to decouple your game state from how it will be rendered. We also want to decouple our game speed from the paint rate. Uh, so if your game is running at 30 frames per second and then you switch to 60 frames per second, uh, that should make your game smoother, not faster. You don't want a character that's uh, moving across the screen to start speeding up or slowing down based on the frame rate. Um, this is because we're, uh, when you're animating, we're animating discrete frames, but we're trying to simulate continuous movement. The animation frame of the browser is not consistent, so uh, when we subscribe to the animation frame, it's best to subscribe to the delta, pass that time to the tick message, and then scale everything by that delta. So whenever we get a tick to move forward our game loop, we might ask, okay, how far did the pirate move in the past 16 milliseconds? Or how far did the pirate move in the last 22 milliseconds? And that number is going to be slightly different on every tick. But doing that keeps the pirate speed constant across the game, no matter the frame rate. Inevitably, though, you're going to get stuck. And so uh, some common solutions are, of course, to Google things. Uh, the Game Dev channel on Slack is a great place. Uh, the Game Jam community for whatever jam you're on might be good as well. Uh, but here's another alternative that I'm really a big fan of. When you're stuck on a programming problem, the best way to get unstuck is often to express a problem in a different medium. This might be verbal, such as in uh, rubber ducking. Uh, but one of my favorites is visual. Take a problem and draw it. So here's an example of a problem I ran to on Safe T. Uh, I was working with tile maps, and I'm storing one long list of tiles uh, that I want to break into a map. The list kind of looks like this, tiles one through nine, and I want to know what is the position of tile five. You can do this with division and remainder, but I was getting answers that were slightly off, and I had all these random negative ones I had to throw in there, and so I figured, let's draw it. Let's try to understand what the problem is. And you look at this, and you try to see, okay, what is the pattern in this grid? Uh, something's off. And then I thought to myself, huh, if I'm doing all these negative ones, why don't I, instead of starting my tile counts at one, a lot of things in programming are zero index. Let's try starting at zero. And all of a sudden, wow, look at this thing. Look at the symmetry. Top corner, zero, zero. Center, one, one. Bottom corner, two, two. That looks really good. And it turns out that worked. Uh, so having zero index tiles was a solution. Drawing is also a great way to explore problem space. Uh, again, looking at tiles, I needed to know what are all the possible different ways that tiles can have neighbors. It turns out the answer is nine, but I couldn't have figured that out without actually drawing it. 
And remember, there's a deadline. So it's okay to take the answers you have from your drawing and then just brute force the answer. So in my case, uh, for handling neighbors, I just wrote a case statement with nine cases. We can take that to an extreme here, uh, where on down the river, the obstacle course, I actually drew out all 49 possible combinations of obstacles that could randomly happen in the game to try to figure out which ones do I want to allow and which ones are sort of game ending states that I don't want to permit. So hopefully this uh, quick tour has inspired you to join a game jam. Uh, they're a lot of fun and it's a great way to take that dream that you have and make it a reality. If you're interested in the source for the games I've built, uh, you can find them mostly on my GitHub, safety, down the river, uh, ship it under Joshua Clayton, and then Muses. Finally, my name is Joel Kenville. I'm a developer at ThoughtBot, and you can find me uh, at these places. Thank you.